here. Uh, it's sort of a misnomer because I'm not very modern. But, uh, um, each year, as you probably know, the Foundation for Excellence uh, awards a medal, uh, medal for excellence teaching uh, to an elementary uh, school teacher, uh, secondary, a college, and a university level, as well as uh, an outstanding administrator. What we, uh, the, the award winners uh, have an organization called the Circle for Excellence. Idea being, <coughs> no, it's not a circle of excellence, it's a circle for excellence. The idea being to circle the state advocating excellence in education, which is something we all, all are in favor of. But we asked three of, of uh, this year's honorees uh, to uh, speak about their passion for teaching and maybe their innovative classroom uh, techniques. Uh, unfortunately, one of, uh, one of uh, uh, Dr. Jill Steely, who teaches second grade at uh, Central Elementary School in Coeta, uh, became ill over the weekend, and uh, she decided it would probably be better not to share her malady with you, uh, <laughs> as well as her wisdom. So I promised to fill in, but uh, Jill actually emailed our other panelists saying, talk longer. <laughs> don't, don't let him <laughs> Uh, our first panelist today is, uh, is uh, uh, John Waldron, who teaches social studies at Tulsa's Booker T. Washington School. He's a national uh, board certified teacher, 20 year classroom uh, veteran, and has a master's degree in international affairs from George Washington University. Uh, he uh, teaches um, both, um, uh, uh, here, <coughs> my nose here, uh, teaches both. Uh, um, uh, world history and Asian history in, uh, in Booker T. Washington's International Baccalaureate Program. Uh, he teaches uh, U.S. government, ancient and medieval history, uh, and AP government and politics. Uh, he's initiated uh, a model UN program for his students. Uh, he, uh, had they, his students run a mock Nuremberg trial, uh, 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 do a uh, Versailles peace conference, uh, and uh, even enjoy uh, Viking role-playing games, uh, according to his bio. Uh, why didn't I have him for uh, more history? Uh, he has, he's built a 1,200-book uh, 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 social studies library that he lends to his students for their research projects. I could probably go on more about him, but, but the title of his talk today is rather, rather intriguing. It's uh, the Bruce Lee Principle. Uh, who to hit first? Oh, I'm sorry. What to hit first uh, when you uh, are facing many challenges? So, John? Thank you, Stuart. Uh, I'll just do another sound check. I think uh, we can all hear each other in this classroom. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming today, all the teachers, uh, education administrators, curious lookers on, and students and future teachers. I want to, I'm going to put you on, on call here. I want to in particular thank Laura Pearson, a student at OU here in the future of education in this state, who was a student of mine. I'm very honored that she would show up on a, on a dreary morning and hear me talk one more time. She's going to grade you. <laughs> All right. So uh, today, I thought I would do a kind of an old-fashioned trade craft talk about you know, uh, what works for me as a teacher. And of course, everybody's experiences are different. Um, but I always do really enjoy listening to other people's, you know, the tricks, the things that, they, uh, that, that help them move things forward a few more inches than might otherwise be the case. So today, we're going to talk about the Bruce Lee Principle. Now, what is the Bruce Lee Principle? Now, well, this is a very female audience. All right. Um, okay. The Bruce Lee Principle is uh, learning what to hit in the right order so that all your challenges go down around you in a nice, seamless fashion. Now, let's, uh, to, to understand where I'm coming from, let's talk about my own uh, conditions. And a lot of you are going to nod because you have similar conditions. Um, I have uh, six classes uh, in a seven-period day. I have 160 students. I teach five different preps. Uh, most of those preps are advanced classes. Um, so uh, sometimes under those conditions, it feels like you're you know, all alone in a dark alley and a bunch of thugs come at you with knives and hatchets. That's when you think, <laughs> what would Bruce Lee do? <laughs> OK. Well, uh, for starters, let's consider that uh, when I came into uh, Oklahoma education 15 years ago, I had a six-period day. The state cap was 140 students. The advanced classes were supposed to have 
you know, 15 students in them, and our school received extra allocations based on the number of students enrolled in advanced classes. We had a 10 minute passing period between classes. We had a 40 minute lunch. Now, lunch is down to 30 minutes, passing period is down to five minutes. They've added an extra period on us. So my work conditions have increased by, say, 15 to 33 percent in 15 years. Um, that's why I think you have to develop a sort of um, mentality of understanding how uh, to prioritize your assignments and your tasks so that everything gets done in a timely fashion. So, for example, to begin uh, the school year, uh, you have, um, you, you get your students, you figure out, you know, what they're like, you establish the classroom procedures for them, you get them used to your own culture, which can be very idiosyncratic, uh, and you get them used to working with each other as a team. I'm going to walk you through the first six weeks of my IB World History class, of which Laura was a veteran. Uh, you might talk a little bit. I don't know how many people here know what the IB program okay. is. Okay, yeah. Um, the uh, IB uh, is the International Baccalaureate. Many of you are familiar with advanced placement. We have two schools in Oklahoma, uh, Klassen and, and Booker T. Washington, Go Hornets, have the International Baccalaureate program. It teaches students uh, in a, a connected curriculum, whereas in AP you would pick courses kind of a la carte, the IB is a menu prefix. You have all of these classes you take at the same time, and uh, you take a series of exams in your junior and senior years to qualify for the IB diploma. It's accepted around the world. Uh, many colleges offer, uh, extra, offer credit to American students for taking their IB classes. Fewer than accept um, AP credits because, well, I think the IB got in the uh, door a little after AP. Um, but what they do find is that uh, students in the International Baccalaureate program have the highest uh, ratio of uh, graduation in four years. They'll, they're more likely to graduate as a cohort four years through rather than AP students. So it's, um, you know, if the measure of uh, your readiness for college is the level of rigor you chose to take in high school, well, then the IB is one of the higher ones. Now, admittedly, I have... Um, I have, in addition to the IB World History, I have a standard level World History survey. IB is 20th century. The World History Survey is Stone Age to the Space Age. The IB students are mostly juniors and seniors. The uh, World History students include on-level sophomores and students, uh, even seniors, retaking the class. So big variety and change between those. So it's very uh, different. And the moves you use in the classes are different. To, I'm going to continue my Bruce Lee metaphor. OK, so uh, when, that's just the beginning. Then when you think about how you have end of instruction exams to prepare for advanced placement or other standardized tests, you have the curriculum standards laid out by your district, uh, Common Core, if we're going to keep using Common Core next year. Um, you have uh, the, uh, maybe you've got club activities and all these other things. It's easy for the new teacher coming in to think that it's impossible or to um, be really frustrated by their inability to do everything that they're supposed to do. And you know, I think uh, veteran teachers will know that we kind of set up new teachers for failure by telling them that if you apply all your, uh, everything we taught you properly, everything in the classroom is going to go just fine. And if it doesn't, <laughs> if it doesn't, whose fault is it? It's the teacher's fault. So first of all, you have to accept that that's not going to be. But if you have a mentality of practical, um, you know, uh, awareness of what your tasks are and the right order, then you can make some met a sense out of the chaos that is the modern school classroom. Okay, so now here's a six-week curriculum uh, outline for a class. I've got copies here. I brought a prop today, too. Did I mention all the grading you have to do? <laughs> this was my fall break grading here, mostly. But, okay. How do you make it work? What's worked for me is that you establish a culture in week one. Here are the methods. Here's the routine. Here's, uh, here's what to expect in talking to me. And here's how you should talk to each other. You know, the basic stuff, too. Like, here's how you use the bathroom pass. <laughs> but you're also establishing a foundation for how to learn in that class. And that word I used uh, before, culture, is very important. You have to establish the culture of the classroom so that expectations are clear. In the first week of my IB World History class, my job will be to establish a sense of what the world was like in 1900. What were the basic conditions? 
What was imperialism? Who were the major powers? What were the major ideologies? And what were the political conflicts of the day? You must begin by lecturing. All right, now their lecture is a, you know, it's a controversial word in education. Are we supposed to lecture? That's the factory model. But you can't get kids to learn about the causes of World War I by talking to each other unless they each have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. So you must give them things to contribute. But you quickly move from there to, well, I start off the uh, year with a game about, uh, which I call Grand Imperialism. The students group into uh, seven different powers. They have a list of colonial territories they have to fight for, and you set them up to compete to have the biggest colonial empire. Yeah, that's right. You reproduce the, uh, the imperialism and the warmongering and the bigotry of the time to teach them how it happened. Uh, you get their competitive instincts going, but you also teach them to work as teams in a way that uh, develops the vocabulary and the rhetoric of the lesson. They learn through this game what the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad was about and the roots of Anglo-German naval rivalry and other things that are going to feed later into your next unit uh, lessons of world, the origins of World War I. You also give them the textbooks, and you establish that they have to read, but they also have to write. You know what I'm talking about? Journal entries. The students have to write a summary of the chapter. They have to identify key terms. Most importantly, they have to analyze ideas in the chapter, make connections, and bring their own contributions into the classroom. In that first week, you're teaching them um, to work together, to understand the basic uh, content of the unit, but you're also teaching them by read, write, learn, how to assimilate the knowledge they are getting and how to analyze material, which will come very handy when they take their first uh, big test. Okay, so that's week one. And hopefully you didn't have too, much, uh, other, too many other things going on in the schedule. Uh, you haven't got too many students transferring. Raise your hand if you have your students transfer out of class in the first week. <laughs> Another half transfer in. Okay, Bruce Lee's not perfect. Okay, week two. Now we're at the causes of World War I. Again, there's stuff that you just have to know in a social studies classroom, and you have to communicate it to the students. Uh, you have to, what I like to do is analyze different authors and their perspectives on the First World War, and then to teach the students that history is a conversation between different authors arguing out uh, the historical ideas. They start to yawn, you move them into your next simulation, which is a game I call The Guns of August. It's named after a, an author, Barbara Tuckman, who wrote a great book about the origins of World War I. Once again, they're grouped into countries, and they each work through the diplomatic moves of the June, July, August 1914 crisis that led to World War I. The idea is to teach them that World War I happened pretty much by accident. You have seven uh, teams there. Each one is following a rational program, and they crash, and they cause this big explosive conflict. Um, that idea of student-centered participatory exercise, uh, founded on the participation you, you gave them in week one, sets them up for understanding points of view about the conflict. All right, week three. Oh, again, I gave them another journal entry on week two. Week three, you get into the war itself. It's hard to teach this one uh, through interaction. There's a lot you need to teach, but if you've done it properly and established the foundations in weeks one and two, then you're constantly making connections back to the interactive exercises the students went through and the points that you made earlier and to what they've read about in the textbook. You see it has to be interlocking. Bruce Lee is already, already figuring out he's got to hit here, and that's going to relate to this move here, and that's going to open him up for this, the leg sweep that takes out the guy with the big stick. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're, while you're teaching uh, the causes of the Great War and their third chapter uh, journal entries, you're busy grading their second chapter journal entries. <clears throat> Week four, you covered the First World War. Now it's time to bring them into an interactive again. The beauty of teaching the modern age is that the students have access to the sum of all human knowledge. It's out there. It's very challenging and dangerous when the kid looks up a fact you just stated and corrects you based on Wikipedia. You've got to be ready for that. You have to use that uh, as a weapon, too. Uh, you can go re-edit 
Wikipedia. That's true. And you, you probably <laughs> no. I, I can't do it from my computer because some mischievous kid at Booker T hacked into too many Wikipedia things. But uh, <laughs> yes, you're right. Someday I'm going to start writing my own Wikipedia entries once they invent automated grading programs. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're at uh, the aftermath of the war. And, and social studies breaks down into three basic questions. You know, what are the causes of a thing? How did it work? And what are the consequences? Causes, conduct, consequences. You're moving into the consequences round. You, uh, World War I had this nice finishing point, the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, which produced the tragic Versailles uh, Treaty and laid down the seeds for uh, World War II. You give the students, again, individual countries to research. They have to look up what were their territorial demands, what were their uh, issues, and which side did they play, uh, did they fight on, and what were their uh, demands uh, afterwards. You put them all in a room together again, and this one kind of works like a Model United Nations event. The students have placards and they argue various points. Because they're arguing with each other, you, know, you probably notice this, kids are more peer focused than they are focused on the teacher. Let the students teach each other. At this point, all you have to do is check that they did their research and uh, note the comments that they're making. You still want the students to write about this, because I'm a big uh, fan of writing about your experiences to internalize the learning. It's like what Shelby Foote had to say, the great historian. Facts don't become the truth until you handle them, until you love them. So you've got to get the students to love history by first teaching them to argue about it and then to write about the consequences of those arguments. If you set up your Paris Peace Conference uh, correctly, they'll have come out with a historical result. They'll have screwed it all up. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, sets the stage for uh, your first unit test. Uh, uh, you can now test the students on the 1900 to 1920 period based on what they heard you lecture, based on what they read, based on what they wrote about what they read, based on what they argued, and based on what they wrote about what they argued. And interlocking, comprehensive uh, unit plan that puts everything in order. Of course, the uh, thing that's really uh, bedeviling you at this point is once you've tested them, and it's got to be essay-based, you've got to uh, teach them. You can't just give a multiple choice test about World War I. Uh, textbook companies would, like, would love to break everything down into multiple choice and short answer test uh, questions. You can have the kids answer it online then you can look at their answers online next to the preferred or recommended answer provided by the textbook company. That's evil. I don't believe in the recommended answer. Um, you've got to let the kids express themselves from what they've learned in the ver a variety of ways that they've learned. Uh, and that's got to be on, uh, I think you have to get them to write essays. You have to have them handle primary source documents and tell me what you think about that. They've had some practice in all those journal entries they did in the weeks before. See, all that fits together. Um, and so good. You got them assessed. They've turned in all this work. They've written all this beautiful stuff about the history. Great. Except, there you go. So you have 160 students in your classes, and world history was only one of them. By the way, the recommended uh, class size for an IB world history class, 15 students. This year, my biggest class, 31 students. Imagine you have 160 tests, and it takes, give me a number, how about uh, 10 minutes to grade each one? Well, do we have any math teachers in the room? <laughs> Try to get it down to eight minutes, and now you've got, uh, let's see, that's 120, that's 20 hours, isn't it? Um, and you have to find 20 hours in the schedule. There's an old saw that says you have time to plan, or you have time to grade, or you have time to work with parents and students, maybe at best you pick two of the three at any given time. So how do you do it? Well, this is where I invoke my second element, and this is called the Houdini principle. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry Houdini, great wizard, uh, you know, escape artist uh, par excellence. Uh, his uh, most famous trick, anyone know his most famous trick? Anyone? Underwater. Yes, the tank of death. The tank of death. There's a big tank uh, filled to the brim with water. Houdini's uh, straight jacketed, he's handcuffed, chains are wrapped around him, and they throw him in the tank. Then they seal it up. Three minutes go by, and Houdini comes out. It's amazing. How does he do it? Houdini's secret was that he would make a splash. He would go into that tank and splash water out 
creating a thin pocket of air at the top of the tank from which he would draw his second breath while he's pulling the key out to uh, undo the handcuffs and so on and so forth. So he would be out in three minutes and everybody would be amazed. You have to make a splash. There's all the things that you have, you're told to do in any given day and if you tried to do them all, all the time, you'd go crazy and you wouldn't get anything done. You make a splash, you create the space you need to make everything else work. So what I do at that point is I stop assigning journal entries and start the kids on their long-term research paper assignments. That's where my 1200 volume library comes in. The kids, you start throwing books at the kids, you get them to read those. My old mantra was read 30 pages a day and you'll be fine. <laughs> While they're working on those things, you're creating the space you need to grade those. I find that a test cycle for me takes three weeks between you know, writing the test, administering them, catching all the kids who need makeup tests, and grading the last one. I'm lucky if I can do that in three weeks, which means I can have best tests maybe three times a year, or three times a semester. But you're pretty much always grading papers like that. When the, uh, when the tablet guy who was here last time comes out with the automated essay grading systems, I'll be suspicious but very hopeful. <laughs> um, the nice thing about the school year is that at this point you're into week six, which traditionally was when we would issue our first uh, progress reports. And um, our first progress reports would come out, not that that really matters in an age of online grading, but that's also when you would schedule parent-teacher conferences. The parents come in, they want to know what you've been doing with your kids, uh, with their kids, and you can tell them, well, here's all the assessments that they've, uh, that they've been given. Here's what we've covered so far, and what you should, uh, if you're concerned about how your child is performing, have them lay out all those sheets of paper uh, on the table and look at the comments. Teacher comments are still essential, I think. You really have, that's another line of communication, a one-on-one -on -one line of communication you have with the student. So you have laid down a track of commentary on all the paper that they gave you, or in the future, all the e-files they're gonna give you. Uh, and they can look at those for patterns. The student, the parent-teacher conference becomes an invitation for the student to then go and review everything that you've, ha uh, you've given them. Uh, hopefully, by the end of that six weeks, you're well on the way to finishing the first uh, set of test grades. You've laid down the culture for the classroom, and you've established a multi-layered way of learning for, the, uh, for students. That's the Bruce Lee method. Um, and uh, it's worked for me so far, but I'm sure there's a guy behind me with a club ready to give me a wallop. Um, the last thing I want to say about this, though, is what I, to come back to what I said at the beginning. It's a bit like waiting for Superman. We kind of expect teachers these days to go to heroic lengths to fulfill their requirements. We've had a 23% cut in per pupil uh, adjusted for inflation student spending. And that just means we've made the teachers work that much harder. Mm -hmm. And I guess I wonder, is that good public policy? Do we want to expect our teachers to always be able to do that level of work all the time? Does this become the new norm? And then uh, five years down the road, when we have the next economic crisis, do we expect Bruce Lee to grow wings? That's all I have to say for now. <laughs> if anyone would like to see any of my lesson plans, I have a, a few of them here. Uh, I didn't make co copies for everybody. But I do have a list of my, uh, I have my curriculum unit here for anyone who wants it, and I can show you some other materials. Uh, I'm going to now defer to my... That. <laughs> <laughs> really very, very, very impressive. Um, I wish I had, I had, I thought I had a good history teacher while I was in high school, but um, can't hold a candle to uh, John. <clears throat> this May, uh, Ruth Askew Brailsford received the Medal for Excellence for teaching at a regional uh, university or community college. She's the uh, chair of the speech and theater department at Eastern Oklahoma State uh, College in Wilberton, where she serves as the honor program, honors program coordinator and teaches uh, honors seminars and introductory speech every semester. Uh, in addition, she runs a she uh, she teaches creative writing at the local prison. Um, she has helped her honor students. Uh, um, organize a campus-wide recycling program, uh, lead uh, uh, or 
co-lead uh, local voter registration drives, uh, coordinate a Constitution Day, and the list goes on. And I don't know how she does it, but then I don't know how John does it either. So uh, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ruth's topic is uh, actually rather apropos. It's uh, Jenny and Johnny can uh, can read, but can they think? And that's really that's where the rubber meets the road. I'm going to move this over because I have a really big voice. <laughs> when No Child Left Behind became the law of the land, I remember thinking, I hope I'm still in the classroom when those children who are no longer left behind get to junior college. I hope I am there so that I can compare them to the students who I suppose were left behind in the 80s, uh, uh, who were, uh, many of them, quite remarkable young people who are now in, you're probably some of them, in their 40s and are uh, uh, re uh, remarkably functional in our society today. John's probably one of them. <laughs> this was my hope. I am still in the classroom, and the, the, uh, they are coming in. And I do believe that many of these students have uh, greater, have uh, better skills in terms of in wh wh where I am in terms of writing. I don't do numbers myself, and I know that you can survive without them, so uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not evaluating that. But in terms of oral and written communication, I do believe their skills are a bit better. However, my observation is that many of them can not think. Let me give a little bit of background. I, the bulk of my career was in Tulsa. I taught at Jenks uh, High School during the golden age of those 80s and uh, uh, early 90s. I uh, taught as an adjunct at OSU. I went to Holland Hall for six years. I uh, have been an artist in the schools from Coweta to Sand Springs, from uh, Bigsby, back when Bigsby was a small school, uh, to Owasso. I am now in a very small rural junior college. Our students come from very small schools in southeastern Oklahoma. and from Broken Arrow and Owasso and Tulsa and Northwest Classen and those kinds of schools so that they can play baseball. We have a wonderful baseball team. And from Memphis and Washington, D.C. and Florida and Chicago so they can play basketball. So we have a, a, a lot of diversity. We, uh, we also have non-traditional students. The basic profile are women in their 30s who have thrown out their last lousy man <laughs> and have decided they've got to get it together and get an education and raise their children. Many of those uh, women, and they're not all women, I, we so also have a lot of vets now. We have a lot of Iraqi and Afghani uh, uh, war veterans, and they are both male and female. So we have a lot of diversity at, a, at our school. And um, I enjoy it a lot. However, the veterans can think. The veterans can problem solve. The, the veterans are alive because they can. And sometimes when I'm, when I'm talking with my students and I'm so with them, I tell them, I'm sorry, Brenda, I'll stay, I'll stay. Uh, I, t I tell them, I am your master shop sergeant. I am keeping you from getting your butt shot off as you board the sands of Iwo Jima in your own life, your own Iwo Jima. 
in your professional life, in your, um, in your personal life. Let me help you develop the skills. I will boil down my method of teaching to three. Relationship, 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 which you cannot do very well with 35 students in the classroom. I was a classroom teacher. I, was, I, I had 35 students in the classroom. I know, and five sections a day. I know what that is like. Very, very, very difficult. Relationship, 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 critical thinking, and experiential learning. That is my method of teaching. I have some uh, guests in my home, and they are a young man and a young woman who live in LA and on, are on the very edge of hitting it big in uh, the music world. I, uh, they are visiting, I didn't know them before, <laughs> they are just lovely, lovely young people. And so I asked them, what, uh, they both went through LA school system. What should education be for you? And Christopher said, it is all about focus. It's all about self-discipline. That's what they need to be teaching in school. It is not about dreams. Everybody has dreams. It's not about motivation. Uh, every, you, you, your dreams can motivate you. It is not even about your skill development. It is about learning how to focus, how to discipline yourself so that you can learn. Jennifer said, relationship, 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 connection, and communication. That's what I wish I had learned in high school. What I think can help in terms of developing that relationship, and certainly there's teacher to student relationship, and it's important. But there are students to students, and I loved what John said about the culture of learning, the culture of group work. I have so many students, when I say, okay, divide into groups, oh no, I want an A. I don't want to work with a group. They might bring down my A. <laughs> We'll go into groups, and I will just tell them I'll do it all and tell you what to report. <laughs> we'll meet back here next Wednesday. We'll do our report. I will give you exactly what you're supposed to say because I want it to be perfect because I want an A in this class. Of course, Haley, how are you going to get to control the whole world that you are going to live in, <laughs> this 18-year-old uh, wunderkind? How are you going to control the world that you're going to live in? You're not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to figure out the give and take. You're going to have to figure out the problem solving. You're going to have to figure out who has what talent so that you can make uh, your group function effectively. And so I was really impressed with what John said about setting that up right at the beginning. In the group is not the time to, to learn that. Uh, 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 to, but in the beginning of the class, setting up the parameters, the rules of relationship and group work. One of the nice things about being 64 years old and having, and I love, by the way, being 64 years old, and having taught all these years is that now I can find out if I ever, if I taught anything. Now, I personally don't do Facebook, but my son does Facebook. And so, on that lovely night in May when we were at the banquet, and after I did my little speech, my son Facebooked it immediately, hmm. right there at the table. I, I looked over him and I said, put that away. My goodness, what are you going to do? Embarrass me to death. Uh, and 
uh, right there before, you know, President Bourne and the president of my college, and he's on his phone. Oh, my goodness. He had just Facebooked the speech. And what happened, of course, then, were that students that I taught many, many, many years ago were able to l like it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and respond. So a couple of nights ago when I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, I called my son and I said, could you Facebook for me again? Could you ask my students if they learned anything from me and if they did, what was it? Now, Paul was uh, graduated from Jinx, and uh, so he was during the, my Jinx years. Several students wrote back. Not one of them said, I learned verb subject agreement. <laughs> <laughs> Not one of them said, I learned really specific ways to develop character. <laughs> By character, I mean characters in acting. I was teaching theater as well as English. No, that's another story. <laughs> that was the day that I called the vice principal and said, Mr. Means, I don't think I can think anymore. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Means. <laughs> Mr. Means, this is Ruth Brelsford. I just wanted to tell you that I don't think I can teach English anymore. Excuse me. <laughs> Mr. Means, you know that English classes require a great deal of grading. <laughs> and you know that I'm directing six shows a year. I just want to request that perhaps I don't teach English anymore. <laughs> anyway, that was another story, sorry. <laughs> I did teach a little bit of verb subject agreement in my life. <laughs> None of those students said that, however. What did they say? She recognized our differences. She celebrated our differences. She helped us celebrate and navigate our differences. One student said, She's the first teacher who ever gave a damn about me. And you know what? It actually made a big difference in my life. Another student said, what I learned doing theater has become <coughs> the foundation for my life. Theater programs are being cut all over Oklahoma, certainly all over the nation, the arts, are not considered important unless you do go to Booker T. Washington or Jinx High School or Broken Arrow. But you, you know what? They're not important in Red Oak. They're not important in Poto. They're not important in uh, Walika. Not anymore. And yet, that's where relationship, communication, group working, experiential learning, problem solving, happens in those kinds of classes. But they can also happen, those kinds of things can also happen in the regular classroom. And um, I want to tell a couple of stories. John, will you, or Stu, you'll give me the high sign. I want to, I want to give a couple of stories that, uh, uh, that actually do have to do with theater, but could work in other kinds of uh, curriculum. When I was at Jenks, we uh, decided to do a Susan Zeter play called Mother Hicks. It is a lovely play, and it is about a, uh, a, a, an older woman who has been ostracized by the community. She's considered a witch and a young deaf boy. And so we are doing all of our research for this play. We've cast it. We're ready to go. And I realized that at the Center for the Physically Limited there in Tulsa, there was a really thriving little theater company. So I thought, oh, wouldn't this work nicely? And we'll take, I'll, I'll take my students from Jenks to, uh, most of whom who had never been north of 41st Street. 
all the way up to Third and Utica. And we will go to the Center for the Physically Limited and we will work with some uh, hearing impaired people. We will, we will meet some people who are uh, interpreting ASL. We will work with them. And that is exactly what we did. We did, took a little field trip up to the Center for the Physically Limited. While there, I got the great idea. Why don't we recast this? And why don't we do a play with these adults who have physical disabilities? And that is exactly what we did. We had people in wheelchairs. We had people who had cerebral palsy. We had stroke survivors, some of whom could speak and some of whom could not. We had hearing impaired people. We had blind people. And we, these were adults. And we cast them without regard to their disability because that was the philosophy of the program, that there are people in this world who are blind, and there are people in this world who can't hear, and there are people in this world who are in uh, wheelchairs, and there are people in this world who are on walkers, and if there are people in this world who are like that, then why can't they be the characters in a play? And so we blended these two casts with these lovely, wonderful, dedicated young actors, 16, 17, and 18 years old, with these actors who, most of them were in their 30s and 40s, who were have, and many of them had lived a life of disability, with disability. It was magic. It was magic. What happened on the stage was magic, but what happened in the lives of both groups, of both casts, because many of the people who had lived with disability all of their lives were used to being, con being considered freaks. They were used to young people turning and going the other way in the mall when they walked along in kind of a crippled, sometimes, you know, uh, unattractive fashion. They were used to kids either making fun or, or, or heading the other way. And here they were being respected and talked to, and listened to. And of course, for the kids, it was incredible. Their eyes were open. In addition to that experience, I want to tell you kind of an opposite experience. I was doing the play, Playing for Time, at Holland Hall. And I had always wanted to do that play, but I'd never been in a place where that where enough women could play a musical instrument. <coughs> uh, Holland Hall, of course, is a very expensive private school, college prep. All those kids, they are there. Their parents are paying $9,000 a year, so they will get into Harvard and Yale, and most of them do. Uh, maybe not Harvard and Yale, but at least, you know, Duke is their, like, second layer school, if you can believe that. <laughs> oh, you is only if only if they can just can't get in anywhere else. Uh, safety. We do the same thing for free. <laughs> and it should be happening all over this country for free. Uh, uh, absolutely. By the, this is another commercial. But isn't it strange that some people are suggesting that our public schools not get the funding they deserve so that people can go to private schools where they will have small cast class sizes and the arts and uh, enrichment and uh, all the opportunities that we don't have in public school because we don't have the money and because we have to teach to the test and because we have this core curriculum that we just have to get done. But we would like for them to, that those, the, our schools are doing that, so let's put them in private school where they will get what they used to get anyway for free. And it didn't even have to have to be Booker T. Washington. I don't understand this. So I, don't, I, don't, I don't get this. Maybe some of them need some of the problem-solving, critical thinking skills, you know. Some that, of the voters, too. <laughs> that, we, that, that we need, that we're talking about. At, at Holland Hall, all, there's an arts requirement, and so all of the girls were either in theater or orchestra. So I had all these lovely young women who could play string instruments. 
I can do Play Me for Time, which is the play about the Jewish women who avoided uh, death by being in an orchestra. You may have seen the Vanessa Redgrave film a long, long time ago. I loved it. We did all of our research, extensive, extensive research, and we were cast, and we, we were really moving right along, and the young women who were playing the Jewish girls who were prisoners in the concentration camp were really doing a good job. And uh, the, but the girls who were playing the Nazis, and especially the girls who were playing the capos, I think is how you say it, the, the people who had, um, were cooperating with the Nazis. These girls were having a very, very hard time. How can you be mean? How can you, they were so artificial, they were so stilted, they were so afraid. So one day I decided to do trust exercises. And you may know these if you've done group activities uh, where, you, where one person is blind and the other person leads them around the room and it develops relationship and it develops uh, 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 communication. I usually ask that it's nonverbal and so the person who can see is uh, using nonverbal communication to help the person who can't see to be safe. And so we did this for a long, long time and all around the room and all around the school, all around the Walter Art Center and in and out of uh, rooms. And then I stopped and I said, let's take a break and then we'll, then we'll switch. And when we switched, the girls that had been blind now became sighted. And those who had been sighted became blind. And I took the new leaders to the side and I said, I want you to do purposely, just, you know, have them bump into a table. Have them try to step off a step and, and it be a little bit deeper than, than, uh, than they think. Uh, uh, accidentally run them into a wall. Uh, don't hurt them badly, of course, but just, just, just let, betray their trust. And so they did. Now these girls had uh, had been in my theater program for years, and they were very, very, very disciplined. If I said don't open your eyes, they were not going to open their eyes. If I said it's nonverbal, they were not going to talk. I let it go on for for quite a long time. Soon I realized that girls were crying. Girls who were leading were crying. I noticed that some girls who were eating were not crying. They were giggling. They were having fun. It was just kind of fun to Finally, the girl who played the lead, the Vanessa Redgrave, Redgrave uh, role, was walked into a wall. And she stopped and she screamed, no, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. I can not do this. And I said, you have to. And she did. Continuing on until I called the exercise and we sat down and processed. The point being that that rehearsal when I thought we should have been learning lines, that rehearsal, when I thought it might not be the best use of our time, was the single best rehearsal that we had. Because they learned something here, here, not here, but here, in their bodies, in their hearts, in their souls, about what it feels like to have your trust betrayed. What it feels like. No one wanted to admit that they could kind of enjoy having that kind of power. What it felt like to have to hurt someone when you really didn't want to, but you were afraid for yourself. What it felt like when you wanted to scream, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. Oh yes, you can, you have to. 
all her life she had been able to say, I can't do this. No. She knew what that felt like. Experiential living, learning, is, um, are, is key to what I do. Those were theater stories, and you're sitting there saying, but I don't teach theater. I teach core curriculum. I teach social studies. I teach English. I use these same kinds of techniques in, uh, in those kinds of classes, too. Is it time? Probably. No one wants you this time. Let me tell one, just one more thing. My sister writes, and she wrote a book called Kind of Kin, which is about immigration. This, uh, and I'm, I'm telling this story to ex give the example of how uh, one can use problem solving and experiential learning in the, in the regular classroom. I teach a humanities class. We read the book. We read the book. Talked about immigration. Then we actually talked to a person who is interviewed, a person who is second generation legally here, Mexican American. We talked to a minister who is totally Spanish speaking. We had to use an interpreter to interview him. We then talked to the local DA and then we talked to a man who unabashedly uh, uses people who are not documented. He hires them. He will tell anybody and everyone that he hires him, them and uses them. And he has all sorts of reasons for that. Those students went through the book, which was based on uh, House Bill 1804, which made it a felony to um, to uh, harbor or, or, transport. or transport or help uh, people who are not documented. They read the book. It happens to be set in our, our little neck of the woods, so we retraced the steps where the, st the, st the, the, the standoff between the uh, Sheriff's Department and uh, uh, happens at the Baptist Church. We went to the uh, jail where uh, where one of the main scenes happens. We went. We made that little tour. We did those interviews, not just not just people talking, but actually requiring my students to to ask the questions. So we did those kinds of interviews, and then they had to write a policy paper. They had to first learn what a policy paper is. They had to learn what a policy paper is, and then write a policy paper for immigration reform for the United States of America. Total amnesty, not an option. Put them all in a boxcar and send them back to wherever they came from, not an option. Something workable. And uh, it was quite a learning experience. And, uh, and they, got, they got the core curriculum kinds of things that they needed also but I don't think they will forget the exercise. Thank you very much. Thank you both very, very much. That's uh, sort of moving. Um, well, I'm supposed to, to remind you that uh, you'll get in the mail uh, an email uh, evaluation form. Please do fill that out because we're, we're trying this as a new, sort of a new uh, TAC this year, we really need feedback to figure out what kinds of things you want to hear at the fall forum and what what topics we need to cover. Yeah, just thank you for being here. Have a great third session.